Greetings, this is a reading of the book, The Airship Golden Hind. Some of the language in this book has not aged well and is indeed no longer politically correct. Take caution when listening to this visual audiobook. Footage and photography are provided by Fortations. At Fortations, we believe that the world would be a better place if people spent their time being creative join us in practicing art so we all can be the master of art. Find our prints available at our store www.fortationstore.com Keep our artwork alive by making a donation at fortationsdonations.com The Airship Golden Hind by Brissy F. Westerman Chapter 2 Foster Deck Explains The two chums were not and the least taken aback with the announcement, they knew the way of the late O. See on active service Foster Dick was in the habit of issuing orders for certain operations to be performed without apparently considering the magnitude or the danger of the undertaking. The officer or man to whom the order was given almost invariably executed it promptly in the few cases where the individual instructed to carry out a stunt failed to rise to the occasion that was an end of him as far as his service under Wing Commander Sir Reginald Foster Dyke went. Foster Dyke had no use for faint hearted subordinates. On the other hand, Kenyon and Bramston were astonished at being invited to take part in what promised to be the biggest aerial undertaking ever contemplated after nearly two years on the ground the prospect of going up seemed too good to be true. Business difficulties, perhaps. Hazarded Foster Dyke, noting the faint signs of hesitation on the part of the two chums think it over. But I suppose you'd like to have a few particulars of the stand before committing yourselves. I think it could be arranged, Sir Plight Kenyon, as regards our little show, we could leave it to our head foreman. He's a steady-going fellow, and all that sort of thing, it's merely a question of a month, I suppose. Less than that. Twenty days, to give a time limit, declared the baronet either twenty days or five. However, I outline the salient features of the scheme. Like a good many others, it arose out of an almost trivial incident a bet with an American air staff officer whom I met in London just after the Yankee Seapin for a flew across the Atlantic or rather hawk across without detracting from the merits of the stupendous undertaking. It must be remembered that the Seapin was escorted the whole way and allied several times en route. The Yankee General UB. Audit is his name offered to bet any one dollars and the amount of 50,000 that an American aircraft would be the first to circumnavigate the globe. Half a dozen of us took him on not that we could afford to throw away an equivalent to 10,000 pounds, but because we had sufficient faith in the old country to feel assured that the accomplishment of a flight round the world would be the work of a British-owned and flown machine. Shortly after the wager was accepted came the news that three four had flown from East Fortune to New York in 108 hours, making the return journey in 76 hours. That rather staggered General Audi, I fancy, and he had a greater shock when Ocock and Brown covered nearly 2,000 miles between Newfoundland and Ireland without a single stop. Things from a British aviation point of view look particularly rosy. Then, for some obscure reason, our air board appeared to let the whole matter of aerial navigation slide, or at any rate they gave no encouragement. The big tutables were dismantled and sold powerful aeroplanes were scrapped, air stations were closed, 
and in a parsimonious wave of retrenchment, even our old Royal Air Force was threatened with an ominous relegation to a corps under the control of the War Office. About three months ago, a wealthy Swiss A.M. Chavez, who had made a pile in the United States, offered a prize to the value in British money of twenty-five thousand pounds, drawing to be given to the first airman to circumnavigate the globe, either in a lighter or a heavier than air machine. The prize is open to all comers, and already a Yankee and a German have announced their intention of competing. Behind exclaimed Kenyon, I thought that Fritz, under the terms of the armistice, had to surrender all of his aircraft. But he hasn't, remarked Foster Day, truly. Nor is he likely to, and if the Allies haven't the means to enforce the terms, that's not my affair. If a Hun does compete, let him, that's my view. Providing he doesn't resort to any of his dirty tricks, there is no valid reason why the door should be banged in his face because he's down and out is no reason why we should continue to sit on him. Commercially, I regard German goods as a means to reduce the present extortionate prices of things in England. I am no believer in dumping. I never was. But if our manufacturers cannot compete with the products of a country beaten and war and torn by internal troubles, then there is something wrong somewhere, but I am digressing. Briefly, the terms of the contest are as follows. Any type of machine or engine can be employed, and as many descents as are necessary to replenish fuel and stores. A start can be made from any place chosen by the competitor, but the machine must finish at the same spot within 20 days again. Any route can be chosen so that full advantage can be taken of existing air stations, but and this is a vital point in order to fairly circumnavigate the globe. Competitors must pass within one degree of a position immediately opposite the starting point. Do you follow me? What is known in navigation as great circle sailing, replied Bramston, if a star is made Somewhere on the 50th parallel north, the halfway time will be somewhere 50 degrees south, with a difference of 180 degrees of longitude. That's it, agrees Sir Reginald. Now the difficulty arises where to find two suitable places answering to these conditions, with the exception of a small part of Cornwall to whole of Great Britain lies north of latitude 50. Therefore, to reach the 50th parallel in the southern hemisphere would mean making a position far southern of New Zealand where, I take it, there are no facilities for landing and taking in petrol, nor is the vast extent of the United States any better off in that respect. I think I am right in saying that there is no habitable land diametrically opposite to any place in Uncle Sam's Republic. Foster Dagg produced a small globe from a corner of the room in order to confirm his statement. And the old Bosch is a jolly sight worse off, said Kenyon. I don't suppose any British than Indian will tolerate him. It's certain he won't be allowed to fly over any Allied fortress, so where is he? Paying the penalty for his misdeed, replied Sir Reginald. Grimly, it's not exactly a case of a victus. If he played his game, he would have taken his licking with a better grace because it wouldn't have hurt him so much. How many competitors are there for the Chavez stakes? Sir asked Bramston. A yank a hun, and myself replied Foster Dyke. That is up to the present for some reason. The idea hasn't caught on with our fellows. Probably there'll be a rush of entries later on. Perhaps too late, I'll show you my little craft. But before doing so, I'll 
give you a few details of the contest. My idea is to start from Gibraltar for the actual race. Of course, I'll have to take my airship there, but that's a mere detail. White Gibraltar hears an Encyclopedia Canyon. Look up the position of Gib at 366N. Long. 521W replied Kenyon after consulting the work, and the antipodes of Gib would be lat 366S. Long. 17439E continue the perinet. The longitude. Of course, being easily determined by adding 180 to that of Gibraltar. Now the next thing to be done, as a matter of fact, I have determined it already, is to find a habitable spot approximating to the second set of figures. Look up Auckland Canyon. Auckland is at 3652S. Long. 174.46E replied Kenneth. Why? That's less than a degree either way. Exactly agreed. Foster Day, the next point is to determine the air route between the two places so as to make the best of the prevailing winds. When one has to maintain an average speed of 50 miles an hour for 20 days, the advantage of a following wind cannot be ignored. Your bus will do more than that, Sir Mart. Peter Branson. She'll do 200 and I'll declare the baronet. And peckily, I haven't had a trial spin yet, but she'll come up to my expectations. It's the stops that lower the average. Naturally, I mean to take the east to west course. It means the saving of 24 hours if I took the reverse direction. I'd be a day to the bat on returning to the starting point. The actual court I'll have to work out later. That's where I want expert assistance. Also, I want the aid of a couple of experienced navigators, and so that's why I sent for you. We're on it, declared both Jones. I thought as much rejoined Foster Dake with a smile. There's one thing I ought to make clear the matter of terms. Kenyon made a deprecatory gesture. Not so fast, Kenyon protested his chief it's a rock bottom proposition. Twenty five per cent of the prize if we are successful is your collective share. If we fail, then I'm broke. Absolutely I sunk my last penny into the concern because I'm hanged if I'm going to sit still and let a foreigner be the first to make an aerial circumnavigation of the globe. Now let me introduce you to the airship Golden Hind. 